simply shed to the bone if you will. August 21st, 2022. I am the uncanny valley, sitting in a porcelain tub, knees to my chin, the temperature, needles and pins, hard flush shower water punches my skin. I slither on the tub floor, I recalibrate. I finally seem to have my crooked spine aligned with gush, and not drowning in the osmosis. The deluge seems to spawn water fingers to plug my facial sockets when my placement is askew. A not so gentle reminder that a dipped hip can mean a watery nap. This element cares not, and that's exactly why I chose it. Finally, a courtesy of stiffened equilibrium is awarded, a concert of bone and liquid the boned membrane of pellet-like pitter-patter water that sirens a compress of blood to patchwork rush, allowing me a coagulated exoskeleton as above temperature, so below skin. My eyelids are orange-hued spectacles of which my bad bat vision can parse spasms of the coveted purple tetrahedrons that conjure after Tesla coil spurts. I focus, I transfix on the terraformed orange and allow the purple schisms to collate in the periphery. This relaxes me, as jonesing for the coils will not allow me to dance in the psychic dirt. I remember I am not comfortable, naked with porcelain scuffed bones. I find a distraction in the purple animations, and my care of comfort is hushed quickly and snuffed out. This isn't about comfort, for everything is a tithing now. I see myself taxidermied, stymied, and static, allowing the loudness of this showerhead above to loom like a snake coughing the river. I am still. In this plastered crouch, I feel the blood beneath my thin skin start to break as if every cell was a levee holding back heartache. I remain in pain, I am constant. The purple tetrahedrons begin to echo. The prisms seem to react to my lidded pupils. I am still not hushed. I am still somatic as I give a faint brush of an eye shake to see if we are in sync. I can now flash prisms of where I'm at. The barrage of elements abound, the loud, loud sound, and I see them start to drip below the hedrons as if they are Photoshop layers. I am reminded to be without purpose, to allow the wash of discomfort and somatic awkwardness to dissolve. I am reminded to not mind at all. I am finally here, or there, neither, either or. From my toes to forehead, I separate the membrane of skin and feel the delocation of self within. With my left hand, I begin to peel back my right arm's flesh. I am a faint ghost underneath and am not shocked by the gray ghost of self as I continue to unzip my flesh. I do this for every ligament, placing the skin into a folded pile beside me. I remove my face as if it were a Halloween mask and take a deep breath. I feel as light as a whispering thought. I feel as light as the voice behind the eyes. I can see the schematics of purple tetrahedrons build and bone and orb around me. The hedron is my craft across these murky modes. This is the ship needed to transdimensionally rift through the planes. I now see the sheen of solid purple 
turn into a faint pink, as if it became a translucent, fleshy window. And it encases me as if it were an embryonic sac, holding my spectral fetus in a ghostly womb. I begin to drive the bubble with intention. I begin to float. This pink sack of gelatin fuss lifts me through the bathroom ceiling, through the upstairs neighbor's living room. I see them circled around the floor, laughing, passing around a tequila bottle among the rhythmic bumps of some haughty Spotify playlist. I smirk because even in this translucent lift, I still judge. I keep raising through their attic. And the amount of boxes with their parents' handwriting surprises me as I float up through the ceiling and into the cobalt evening atmosphere above. I look down. There is my street. There is my car. Like a neon satellite picture of ghostly movements on a static city block. My toes start to tremble. I am afraid. I recall my newly found fear of heights as I reach a height where only the curvature of the earth is viewed in a sun-kissed hue. I raise my left hand and reach outwards forever, warping into the space beyond the hues and into the unknown. I raise my right hand and reach outwards forever, warping into a forever distant white dot far beyond the earth below. This is my axis of self. These coordinates of sine wave snakes forever punching out and into each sector of the abyss. They gyrate my bubble as my gray ghost finds footing. I recall this was the key to unlock the hatch above. As I turn my head upwards, I see a luminous bloodwood tree with its radiant red blood beginning to fill my sphere, gushing around my floating specter. I am not scared. I recall this transmutation of blood is the only way through. I focus on the tree and its array of lush hyacinths and marigolds, like beacons on a flight path, and they begin to beat between light and dark in a heart rhythm. As the bloodwood blood reaches my chin, my body is submerged in a blood balloon, suspended yet anchored by sine wave serpents reaching out in every direction far above the earth. I submerge and take a deep breath. I plunge upward. My hand can find footing in the exposed web of roots. As I come up for air, I see my hand is but a shadow, a silhouette of negative space. I pull myself up onto a green terrain as I hear the infinite sounds of fluttering bugs and distant bird cause. To call it night here, well, that would be irrelevant, for this place is beyond the sun. I lay at the bottom of the tree and look up. The bloodwood drips orange and purple petals in an endless autumnal swing. Everything is both lush and devoid here. As I look back where I pulled myself out of, I, I see a large fluttering blue eye with a dark ring around the electric iris. Its pupil seems to be an endless drain of the blue, rushing water that makes the iris. I then see a golden tear where I was birthed out of, both a rip and a drop. This is my left eye and my entrance was the golden mark that I have had since birth, as if my birthmark were my window into this subconscious spelunking. As I stand, I look to my feet. Still, I am a shadow, but there are fluttering lights in my forearms as if my silhouette was encased with distant galaxies and beady stars. I look over my left shoulder and see the echo of my shadow three times over in distinct ghosts. They repeat my movements, delayed and in a syncopated fashion, like a cave echo, and the bright burning nebulas in the chests of each ghost grow dimmer and dimmer down the line, except 
for a fifth. The fifth ghost is still. Its shadowed head now turned to me and its solar plexus filled with a solar system bright, burning, and reverberating as if it were calling to me. I know who this is. This is 2017. This is the echoed self of the past five years ago. Still resonating deep and heavy, I inspect the other three shadow silhouettes and see those burning nebulas grow fainter and fainter in each. The ghost next to me, exponentially dim and crumbling in static, but my ghost, not as dim. I feel hope. I stare at the static ghost to my left and begin to crumble. I feel regret. I feel loss. I reach out to his hand with the knowledge of his impending death. And he crumbles into a whisper. And in a wind gust wash, its detritus comes into me. I do this in sequence with the next two. 2017 remains still, beating a brighter light with each sacrificial ghost. I feel brighter, but I also feel an ethereal bittersweet, an emotion that is not unlike every memory and every wish and every regret into a primordial emotion. I look up to the bloodwood tree, its careening branches and endless petals, with pockets of light emanating from nine spheres and its hierarchy of harrowing branches. I have been through before, never to the top, but through most. I wish to return, but the ghost of 2017 knows I know the shortcuts to reach to the nine universes and knows I circumvent the ones that scare me. The sphere of permanent growth, a loud, breathing forest that engulfs in mountains of insects and ivy. The bright place, a white desert with a solitary man forever shooting out light from his screaming mouth. The warm place, the skull mother house, the apathy of nothingness. He is dismayed at my impatience, this 2017 ghost. I feel ashamed. He places his hand on my chest, syncopating our twin galaxies, and in a hush, he dissipates into television static and blinks into a flash of black nothing. I have absorbed him. I am tired, and I now share this hesitation to move forward. I have been here before, and I will be back again. But I, I return to the iris pool of my birthmarked eye. I am sitting in this shower, drowned in its watery sound. I begin to cry, but the tears are interlocked with the trails of water. 2017. What was different about 2017? And why do I feel a longing for a friend I'll never see again. Is this what a baptism feels like? Multimedia grimoire exploring my personal anarchic praxis of the hauntology of the self, dubiously named Hauntomancy. This following chapter, Sine Wave Serpents, will explore not only the meditation that sparked the praxis, but the audiomancy praxis itself 
of what you are hearing the score of right now. Seventeen, the year of my public magical birth, the year that burned brightly through hip shooting and bandit-like expression, experimentation, and abandon. Five years ago, this meditation helped me realize the specter of self I have since forgotten. Though it forever reverberated brightly in the prism of self, I had not given it reverence. I must create a seance of the self of then and commune with the ghost of what had been. I must practice a necromancy of self and help incur the motivations and wonderment that has set me on this very path. And this is how I am doing it. And it hurts. Memory is a defense mechanism, burned and birthed by the ramshackle need to absolve guilt, remorse, regret. It is a creative fiction at times, one that paints the pareidolia of making meaning out of past patterns and actions. That said, it is not always negative. The negativity comes with the broad erasure of responsibility, of mistakes. Not unlike an algorithmic AI, it tends to snuff out human error. And the human error element is usually what spurns a self into the path we ride. Twenty seventeen sine wave serpents, the ones molded and knobbed by the memory synthesizer, are forever mutable. Instead of reopening the synth patches of what I constitute as the objective of that year, it is necessary to regale the clipping, shorting, and blinding feedback that accrued to such an epilogue. I have painted quite the narrative. Though true in its documentation, it is also untrue in its absence of follies. Yes, this was the year I fell in love with my partner, acquired my Hecate's companion and Zaro, my dog, created the Prag Magic podcast, fervently ordained salons of our collective We the Hallowed, and became work on a mighty hypersigil, Cactus Crown, as Dakota Slim. All valiant beginnings worth celebrating, but in my meditations I have also recalled the numerous street fights with my partner's ex, the reckless alcohol medication abandon, the loss of relationships of multiple friends and collaborators, and the beginning of the end of my home and metaphysical dimming room I had fought so fervently to reside in for many years prior. are the missives worth tithing, as without the warring extremes, without meditation upon the misgivings, my ghost is a fiction. So how am I to commune with an echo? How do I strengthen the tether, the pathways back to a barking specter? 
Meditation was always a primer, a boot up into further investigation for me. The communion and deep dive concerning this self-spelunking is illustrated by the practitioner themselves. Writing, albeit somewhat conventionally linear, as a pathway towards such introspection. But for me, I have found a somewhat multifaceted approach in dimming the contraction to the other, dimming the zimzum. The language I speak, far from the confines of simple gestures, is one that envelops all fiddly digits, both physically and ghostly. Sound, its generations, and my physical interaction with an intentional dominion of disparate talisman has always been the basis of my audiomancy practice. However, I would perform these rites with an objective to help inspire or create, never a direct objective to visit a same skin past self, a haunt. Sound, no, music makes sense as an audiomantic working for this hauntology. The language of music is perhaps the easiest vessel to man the neither neither. Second only to smell sound, especially as a composer, is rife with the esoteric intonations of history, echoed and sauntering through the charging idled movements of rugged synapses and neural highways to spark memory. A mutation of my fervent sound sorcery praxis can commune with something a bit more haunting than an unmoved mover, the ghost of me from a certain time. Scrooge be damned. If a ghost of himself flew through that window, he would have croaked from sheer terror and there would be no Christmas. I digress. From meditation to communion to inspiration, the next objective is to transpose the notes of ritual into a syncopated practice of self-travel through, well, through literal echo and through literal delay. To dim the contraction, to dim the zimzum of here and there, and to sing with the third mind of both. You can listen to this full unedited score and audiomantic praxis at youtube.com slash C slash pragmagic or on the Substack keatsross.substack.com Speaking of the actual praxis, let us now enter the dimming room. Music gives shape to the way we perceive and process our actual life experiences. Ezra Sanzer Bell, Audiomancy. My nostalgia mancy centric audiomancy session I refer to as DIMS or DIM 
slash dimming sessions concerning this 2017 serpent was quite simple. The parameters set would distill down to three. Prism, tether, and talisman. The prism of self is 2017, the year of the witch. I was in Portland, Oregon. I was exiting a relationship, a home, a band. I was celebrating a new relationship, totemic wanderlust, magic, a black dog from Hakate, and being pulled by this very sine wave serpent. The tower card strikes again, and from the ash and rubble, the Dharma bum spits and whistles. Every audiomancy session is improvised outside of these simple parameters. There is only a musical tether, or in this case, a chord, a common chord, that is both a literal and figurative key to unlocking the dimming. Meditation on 2017 takes me to a literal tuning and a chord where most of my writing during that time would orbit. For the sake of this session, I knew I would begin with a simple G minor chord. G minor, as if it were a lesser god, a G dash D chord. An unintentional correlation, but it begs a mention. Minor is also in lunar alignment opposed to major's sun alignment, according to Ezra Sanzer Bell's Audiomancy, a supplemental text to his first book, Astro Music. Lunar is key, not only to my personal Aquarian, Piscean rhythms and literal lunacy, but because it was the full moon before Halloween 2017 that my partner and I met. G minor. This musical tether is the sinew that ignited the musical magical session. The key to generate my psychic engine, a minor ghost. <laughs> Instrumentation is intentional down to the animistic qualities of the objects themselves, history, relation to 2017, and deep meditations on all of the above. After heavy consideration, they are chosen and placed in a circle of the dimming room. In this case, my dimming room is my music studio and magical space. In the past, it would have been a walk-in cupboard Wow, things have changed. My main talisman, my exhaust pipe for this psychic engine would be my baritone electric guitar named Ectogasm. A haunted artifact superbly customized through my chaos over the years. It was gifted to me by a collection of friends who I am no longer close with. And every time I play it, it allows me to channel the whirlwind heat of those magnanimous years after beating drug addiction and relocating back to Portland. But the bittersweet haunts of the impermanence of those relationships, the harbinger of cycles ends also spools. It was also my main tool in my now defunct magic and music project, Spare Spells, whose last album, The Narrows, was released 
in 2017. As well as the main writing tool of my first major hyper sigil, Cactus Crown as Dakota Slim, which would be released the following year in 2018. It is a testament to laying to rest an era and embracing a new one. I have added my partner, Mary's, weighted 88 key keyboard. 2017 was also the proto-birth of our now five-year relationship. It is also something I am not terribly used to playing, which instills a sort of responsibility in adding it. And like the generation of our relationship, it is a microcosm of new, exciting, awkward, come boisterous trepidation. When I reviewed the session, I realized why I went for this instrument long before I picked up my familiar ectogasm. It was a maneuver in intent and focus on the adjectives I just described about my relationships, generation, and 2017. The fact that this talisman is 88 keyed reminds me of Ezra Bell's Astro Music a text that deeply correlates Western esotericism with the language and theory of music. Astro Music mentions that the 88 keys correlate with the 88 days in a mercurial orbit, and Mercury is in direct communion with the general Rider Waite interpretation of the magician in the tarot. Yet, I would argue, though a magician's true work is within the experimentation and evolution of the language of all things, the trade can also prove the most self-deceptive and egoic of communions. A fitting form and symbology considering my entirety of 2017, from fool to narcissistic wielder of the will in one swift move. as ordained by or lack thereof rhythm. This session yields both live percussion and a 70s analog rhythm machine. The machine is not unlike the drum modules found on old church organs, yet it is just the standalone component. Its boxy switches, schizoid tempo fits, and dark hum is an entity all on its own. This odd talisman was acquired trading gear with a close Portland confidant and friend, Brian Bruner. It is haunted by the creaky old punk house we used to reside and symbolizes Portland as an idea to me quite clearly. It's unnecessary weight for what it does, it's finicky buttons, it's overt aesthetic over its simple function and the survivability after all it has been through. Wait, 
Did I just describe Portland or did I just describe myself? The accompaniment of an automaton generated rhythm from the archaic gadget also shares in my need for a third mind communion as stated in the previous chapter. Grumpy and gallant Henry Miller has often used the idea of the automaton to vilify artistry. Due to his mid 19th century arena, he was understandably in a punch funk against literal automation and the disillusion of the wayward artist or the working class. A quote I often carry from the book is, The creative spirits are the fecunditors. They are the Lamed Vav who keep the world from falling apart. Ignore them, suppress them, and society becomes a collection of automatons. I gift that book, stands still like a hummingbird, to nascent youth ready to whiplash the world because of its profundity of heart fists. Though, perhaps you would be hard pressed to know that now the automatons are igniting and working in Congress with most modern and artistic and spiritual praxis, but I will not assume. I'll commune with his ghost another time. My audiomantic practices excise all of the pre-made, preset, sample library, quantized, beat generator, and VST oscillator digital automatons. I am not anti-digital production. As a matter of fact, the digital audio workstation is the greatest empire a pugilist composer can rule over. When it has come to digital voices or samples, I have a strict want and need to create my own to customize from the ground up. I feel the reliance of out-of-box sonics to construct music, let alone audiomancy, cut out a large quotient of my personal audiomantic and composition processes. I am no absolutist about this ever-evolving, productively amorphous personal praxis and can see myself allowing artificial, intelligent bleeps and bloops to maybe hold some of the weight in an intentional praxis as time slithers on. All in all, the haunted and brutally imperfect artifact that is an automaton, in the classic sense of the word, suffices a multitude of intention. When it is stammering with my physical and somatic manipulation, and the human error is tripled by wear, design, and my herky-jerky fits and spits, it seems absolutely fitting within this hauntological pathworking. The allowance of a somewhat simple machine, a non-digital heartbeat, and its almost human heart-murmured spasms are intentionally considered and celebrated. I also toggle the rusty tempo knob when the ghost barks or digitally delay with a cacophonous banish with a classic Boss DD6 delay stomp box.
of these talisman are placed as such so I can dance among them and physically interact. Often, the tether will tug toward me, silencing the beatbox every so often to focus on a physical tempo rubato, a term Ezra Sanzer Bell expounds upon in his text Audiomancy. Tempo rubato, which means robbing of time, refers to playing at one's own pace without strict tempo, was incorporated into compositions of the Romantic period as a way of defying the dogma of classical rhythms and exploring musical ideas with greater freedom. Tempo rubato was the entire score for my past Audiomantic sessions, and here it is played as if it were another talisman. In my previous dims, I would sit in a dark room for at least an hour getting lost in tape loops, glossolalia, and repetition. However, because I am using these hauntological dims as the soundtrack for each of these here haunt manual chapters, it is giving me a way to channel a performative aspect that is seldom exercised. Since experimenting with such a vulnerable practice via unannounced live streams, I have been more physically aware to be pithy and direct in churning through a multitude of synapses that bridge forgotten art effects, forgotten emotions, and forgotten self-speak. The performance aspect of it is as if I am performing for the other, not just an audience behind computers, but by a pantheon of deities, anarchic, imaginative, or cultural, that I have consorted throughout my life, and especially in 2017. And you might be listening to this charged artifact in your headphones, on a train, through your car speakers, or on your laptop while you cook. The ghost is in the machine, and it haunts on. My dimming room ritual layout is as follows. The delay is the sinew. My amp, the star. The keys, the lunar common chord. My acoustic, the sacred feminine. My baritone, the sacred masculine. The altar placed at the top. The deific audience and magical microphone. My rhythm box, the chiron the wounded automaton, and me as the haunt, the seancer and invocator. Now that you might be a little more privy and understand the praxis of the audiomancy of which you are hearing, let us resolve. 2017 haunts for the magnanimous bounties of that year, yet also of the unresolved phrase that lingers still. The meditation in the beginning revealed the quadrant or destination of 2017. And my audiomantic praxis was my trans-dimensional craft to commune those dimensional rifts of back then. 2017 lingers still. It is not a random result considering the Sephiroth meditation spelunking of the self. 2017 haunts for the magnanimous bounties of that year, yet also of the unresolved phrase that lingers still. When 2017 reared its ghostly silhouette to me in that meditation, it was on the anniversary of the Oregon total eclipse, a celestial event that spurned this current reality tunnel. A magical five-year itch. This was not intentional. And like poltergeists knocking about to be heard and considered, all the synchronous events began to rollick and roll. I would even say, admittedly gun-shy about the full woo of what I'm about to admit, that the pathways laid in these processes were as divinatory as they were revelatory. 
Future casting, or planning for us pretentious types, has been quite hazy prior to this investigation of my discography of actions pertaining to 2017. You see, I was heading towards an equilibrium in my second year here in Seattle. My outdoor education summer season had just ended, and I was gearing up for the autumnal swing of a slow and steady fall. I began to absorb into a constant, finally yet hectically nestled in a sustainable rhythm before colluding into this hauntomancy. Yet, the confluence of this audiomantic praxis, the haunt manual oeuvre of a self-hauntology and the expectant of unknown twists howled on through magically interacting with this 2017 ghost a true communion of extremes of stability and kerplunked. This is why I can't have nice things. However, one major concussive question is beginning to itch loudly. Did my fascination with the extremes of the 2017 magic infect and haunt my future? Or was the reveal of 2017 a divinatory guide for the oncoming synchronicities. The similarities between the discordian nature of 2022 and 2017 are personally staggering, but they are about to become flat out gobsmacking. I am riding now on the precipice of a literal return to the environment and occupational community that existed in 2017. After completing my summer semester of outdoor education, right around the time of the meditation in late August, I had a week to collect myself before jumping into the aforementioned fall semester. However, before I could wipe the lichen from my eyes, I was told that fall registration was too low and I would need to find supplemental income. So Seattle already began transmogrifying into a stressful brain fog replete with teeth-chattering uncertainty. However, I kept focus on my creative work during this forced vacation and almost celestially sure that things would fall into place. Just then, I was offered a higher position at the outdoor education headquarters back in Portland but it would begin almost immediately. I had little to no time to deeply consider the amount of blurred, dust-deviled machinations taking the position would incur, but I knew I needed to accept it, if only for a longer interim. My partner Mary, my Hakate hound Zaro, would stay in Seattle as things were sorted in the long game. But where would I stay whilst working full-time in Portland indefinitely? Before I could even comprehend the heap of heavy heading my way, I was offered a room in the exact house where I kindled my relationship with Mary at a full moon Halloween party in, that's right, 2017. I will not only be back with the organization and its familial familiars from that era, but I will be existing in the very house that birthed the relationship that faithful year. It's as if in a psychic effort to hold sanity and quell anxiety, this 2017 sine wave serpent acted as an animated echo, a trans-dimensional belaying agent readying me for the oncoming toils and tussles ahead. Perhaps a cast line from the future, an ad hoc nonlinear life preserver from my super self, from my future self, from my holy guardian angel, a ghost line outside of time.
In the appendices of Dr. Robert Crookall's The Study and Practice of Astral Projection, he notes a very peculiar piece from Jeffrey Hodson's The Science of Seership pertaining to thought forms of deceased children resembling orthodox angels to grieving parents. Occasional forms, then, by vivifying it, add to the prayer force by which it was originally created and inspired. Had I interlocked on a prayer force, an egregore, a thought form of a past self? Did my meditations and audiomantic praxis create a sort of seance of a still vibrating spirit? Did my time in the tetrahedron multiversal sephirot of galaxy ghosts create this pragmatic tether that is now future casting, future conforming? Did my haunted dances of audiomancy charge this very tether and conform the conduit to what need be or shall be? Is this a wanted or warranted change? Is this what I asked for? I am not perturbed by the cascading dominoes that seem sourced at that five-year anniversary Sephiroth meditation. I am impressed, impressed so much that this probable misfire or overshot illustrates that this nostalgiamancy or hauntomancy this hauntological magical praxis of the self is allowing the ghosts of the past to run the asylum of the future and hopefully lay the rough ones to rest. In this shared somatic realm, we baseline perceive time as wholly linear within the alchemical cycles of birth, breath, and decay. This praxis of charging a certain era of the past to cull an era of the future seems to understand this. Outside deep meditation into memories and relishing in these subconscious haunts, it has seemingly afforded me the quadrants to literally be back here in 2017. Sure, the same places, the same people, the same occupation. Yet, as every sine wave snake of self is immovable from the construct of little decay, time hopping is not afforded. This system is brutally imperfect as are the results, and I have no idea the ramifications. the resolve and the results of this hauntomancy praxis. Where have I been last month? Where did these practices take me? Wait and find out and see the avenue that has opened wide. Thank you for listening. You can read these chapters in full at keatsross.substack.com or for as little as a dollar a month you can support me and get some of the demos, full unedited audiomancy rituals, and, well, drafts of these here chapters at patreon.com slash pragmagic. Also be on the lookout for more updates from our We The Hallowed collective at wethehallowed.org. Thanks for listening, and haunt 